But we'll start from the beginning then. I want to, I'd be really interested to know how you got the opportunity to get into the video game industry. What was the first way you entered the industry? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a story that is not likely repeatable today, but, um, it was, it was very kind of happenstance. Um, I have an older brother who went to film school, uh, in Los Angeles and he was very interested in getting into film. Of course, he also wanted to work at Lucasfilm uh, among many, many other places when he was, uh, looking for summer jobs and graduating. And, um, I at the time was in high school. Um, I think I was, uh, just turning 15 or 16, 16, because I was able to drive. And, um, my brother at the, you know, at the time there was no internet that you looked for jobs on. So there were job, job lines, job hotlines that you would call at these companies, you'd call their number and they would have you, you know, press, press six to go to our help wanted area or whatever. Yeah. So my brother was running down that and, and, uh, looking at the list of jobs that was available at Lucasfilm or Lucas, yes, it was Lucasfilm at the game at the time. And, uh, they had, you know, they had a listing for a games tester in our computer games division. And that wasn't interesting to him as a film student, but he knew that, um, uh, his, his little brother B was quite the video game player mm-hmm. and that I played a lot of the Lucasfilm games at the time, a lot of the adventure games. And so he told me about it and said, Hey, you should get a summer job there and, and, and go apply. They have something there. So, um, uh, I had never had a job before, uh, other than sort of teaching, you know, tutoring other students to in computer science, but, um, in programming at a summer school. But, uh, I said, okay, well, this is be a good job as any, and I might as well try. Um, so I put together what I thought a resume might look like, which included some details about me and, and how old I was and what my GPA was and the list of all the games that I'd finished, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, highlighting in bold the ones at the top that were all Lucasfilm, uh, arch- uh, graphic adventures. Um, and I set that in. And miraculously enough, that was enough at the time to get in the game industry. That's 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 what happened. Um, so I was invited up for an interview, uh, which was at Skywalker Ranch at the time, uh, yeah. which is up in Marin County, about 45, 50 minutes uh, drive from where I live in the, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so it's in this very rural kind of area, rolling hills and you know winding roads like a car commercial. And you kind of go up to this nondescript gate. Uh, I think it was 5858 Lucas Valley Road, which is a coincidence. It's called Lucas, Lucas Valley, but... Uh, come to this gate, come in, there's a guardhouse. They say, yeah, roll up to the main house. Um, go, go to the, uh, go park under the stable house yeah. and then go meet your interviewers at the Creek house. And I was like, okay, so what's, where's the stable house? You go up there, this is big rolling, you know, kind of real place with a bunch of nice looking buildings and looks like it's been there a long time. But it turns out it was actually all built by George Lucas to look like it had been there for a long time. Um, and the stable house looks like a place where somebody might store some tables until you drive under it. And there's like the really nice parking garage down there. Uh, got up and went to the Creek House, which is a house kind of built spanning over a creek uh, that runs underneath it, uh, to be my interviewers. Who, you know, I was I was dressed in my my uh, high school finery, which involved a skinny leather tie and a and a teal colored button down shirt and you know dress pants and sweating in the sun in the summer. Yeah. And people came out to interview me wearing sunglasses and shorts and you know looking very relaxed. Uh, so I was interviewed, and they said, you know, what do you play? You know, how long does it take you to finish them? How do you approach them? You ever found bugs in them, and so on. And uh, they said, should we put him on monkey? Yeah, let's put him on monkey. Okay, let's get him. You're hired. Come back, you know, this time in two weeks or whatever. Wow. Um, so I came back. And the, and the sad thing is that in the, in the time between my interview and my start date, they actually, uh, Lucas Home Gaming was, in, was, you know, was kind of squatting in a few rooms in that building. Um, they moved off of this, off of Skarka Ranch. Uh, so that was the only time I ever actually was there for technically for work, although just for my interview, although I went up there for lunch and, you know, softball and 4th yeah. of July parties and stuff like that later. Um, but at my, when I started, they were actually, um, uh, they just moved on to the ILM campus, which was in downtown San Rafael, about 10 miles away. And they just moved into what's called a building, which was a building that ILM had just vacated. And so I kind of showed up the same day that I was moving in and kind of getting their digs and figuring out what was going on there. Uh, and we found, you know, these trashy kind of artifacts of, of that I left behind, you know, random paperwork and scraps of things. They really didn't clean the place at all. And we kind of went through all the offices looking for anything in my left. And then, uh, in the top, in the top cornermost office, we opened a filing cabinet and among all the other desks just left behind was, uh, Howard the Ducks bill, <laughs> uh, the, the costume wow. prop, uh, which some, you know, apparently Howard the Duck was so, so reviled even within Lucasfilm that they, they left the bill behind. Did you keep it? Uh, Sorry. No, no, somebody else got it. And, uh, yeah, I was the new guy, so I, I didn't get to keep Howard the, Howard the Ducks bill. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, I was rapidly sort of, uh, immersed in the, in the, uh, 
Lucasfilm Games QA culture at the time, which was on full display, we took a tour of the facilities, we got a tour around ILM and so on. Um, it turned out that uh, there was an early custom at Lucasfilm Games that the first person with a, with a first name got to keep it, and the second person with the same first name had to have a call sign or a, or a nickname instead. So there was already a Brett there, and um, he already he, his name is even spelled with one T like mine, so uh, they immediately decided that I needed a nickname. Right. Uh, and so as we walked around, they, they were trying to decide on a nickname for me, a person they had never met. Um, so it, as it happened, I, I had driven up in a blue car. I was wearing blue shorts and a blue shirt and I had, you know, even socks with blue rings on them because it was, the, you know, it was nineties, early nineties. Yeah. And, um, they said, well, for now we'll just call him the big blue guy. Cause I'm very tall. I'm six, three. Wow. And they said, well, that's not, that's too long to say. Why don't we just call him blue guy? I said, okay, but that's more of a description. This is all playing out over the course of an hour or so walking around the campus <laughs> and check things out. We'll call him Blue Guy. No, that's just a description. That's not really a name. Well, how about Beluga? Like a Beluga whale? Well, like, you know, no, like Beluga caviar. Well, caviar, what's that? What's Caviar is fish eggs. Yeah. You can call him egg. Okay, you're egg. <laughs> and that became my name. Um, it stuck immediately because I was introduced to people as, you know, this is Brett. We're going to call him Egg. Yeah. And then they called me Egg. And um, about two weeks later, my first paycheck arrived and the person walked in the room with an envelope looking confused and said, has anybody heard of a Brett Bogolevsky? And this is a person I worked with every day and who, who knew me, you know. And I said, yeah, that's me. I said, oh, Egg, I didn't know that was your name. Um, so that was my, uh, that's how I got the job. And uh, I had this summer job. Uh, this summer job that was going to be testing QA on on LucasArts games in this, you know, kind of crowded room with a bunch of other people, random backgrounds, um, testing a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, so that's how I started. That's great. That's a great. Thank you for the insight. I really appreciate that. Um, I've had the pleasure, actually, of talking to James uh, Hampton. and uh, He started at LucasArts as a game Perfect. tester. I don't know if you know James Hampton. Yeah, uh, his, his nickname is Purple. That's right. Yeah, um, it just sounds like everyone has a nickname at Lucas Arts or Lucasfilm. How how great is that? Yeah, well, I mean, if there was a if there was one person named Matt, then the next person who was who came in Matt was something else, and so we had all these crazy nicknames. You know, some of them more creative than others, and some of them more you know suited to the person or the background than others. Mine was very random. You, are you called um, Egg still today, or is that is that past now? No, it's it's kind of tied to that portion of my history, unfortunately. Um, even when I came back um, as a programmer years later, I uh, I was not called Egg, although some people knew me as Egg when I came back. Oh, Egg's coming! Oh, He's back. <laughs> um, but uh, by that point, I was bred. Um, I did at one point. They they let us you know order a lot of the the production you know shirts and jackets and things like that. At one point, I had an ILM jacket. and They ask you, it's like a Letterman's jacket for a sports athlete, and they um, they ask you for your embroidery, and actually, it did say egg on it. Brilliant. Um, but that was stolen out of my car at some point years later. Love that. Um, you said earlier that you, you, you're always a fan of Lucasfilm games before you even worked there. What Really quickly, what games did you, as a kid, did you love playing? You said you actually finished quite a few of them. Uh, yeah, I think right before I applied, I had just finished Sack My Crack and the Alien Mindbenders. Yep. Um, and I'd also played Maniac Mansion. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, what else had I played recently then? Um, I'm trying to remember now what I'd actually played before then. Um, what other graphic adventures there were at the time? Oh, I played Loom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and I finished all those. And I played, you know, along with it, along with those graphic adventures, I also had tons of other adventure games. So I had, you know, tons of Infocom games and and a few Brother Run games and things like that, and uh, CR games and so on. Brilliant. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, you know. Those were my favorites, of course, at the time when Pearl was out. Um, yeah, so when I started, they were um, they were working on Monkey Island, the first one. Um, but they, my first job, I think, was they wanted me to test um, Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders because I was one of the few people there who played it and finished it. Um, they wanted me to test Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. They were doing a special version on a fairly unique piece of vintage gaming hardware called the FM Towns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the FM Towns was this really kind of ahead of its time um, computer from Japan that uh, I think it was based on 386 and it had, you know, um, VGA graphics and it had a sound card and it had a mouse that was like a puck. And so they were doing these sort of up you know, higher res, higher, you know, uh, redone backgrounds, redone character models um, for Zach McCracken for the FM Towns. So that's the first thing I tested. And of course, and then they put me on um, Secret Weapons of Luftwaffe. 
was uh, there was there was like a room that was sort of like graphic adventures were being tested, and there was a room where the flight sims were being tested. So I was with this the sequel weapons of the Luftwaffe. Uh, oh, I played Battle of Britain before I, before I could work there too. So I had some background there. Um, and uh, I was not really cut out for the flight sim testing. I, I kind of just played it. I wasn't as great at finding bugs there, but I was I was pretty well suited for the graphic adventures. So they, they put me on um, on Monkey, which was very, very early build. You mm. couldn't even play it all the way through. Uh, couldn't even play it, I think, past the first island. Um, and then uh, I ended up testing um, Indiana Jones and the, and the Fate of Atlantis. Wow. Oh, that's right. I, I played I played um, Indiana Jones and the, and the Last Crusade. Yeah. I played that adventure game, too. That was, that was the middle one that I played before I started there. So I tested on Indiana Jones and Fate of Atlantis. I was the first tester on that one. Um, I've still got somewhere here like a big, thick printout of all the uh, all the bugs I found and reported, including design bugs. Because at the time, when, the, when it's early on in a game, you can, you can mark a bug as, as a design bug or a suggestion bug. Yeah. So I made a lot of suggestions in that game. I think it was the first game where I ever actually experienced any kind of input into what the game would be. Um, and then I worked on Monkey with everybody else for quite some time. And uh, got to know the people around the building and... Uh, you know, we were the testing crew. It was, it was a weird collection of, you know, older, younger people, all different backgrounds, male, female. Um, and we'd, uh, we hung pretty tight. We were not really kind of allowed to go much around the company except in LucasArts, Lucasfilm Games. Uh, we would go up to the ranch for lunch as a crew, and uh, uh, we had a, a softball team and a company softball league, things like that. Brilliant. I mean, that sounds amazing. I imagine... Uh, you obviously bumped into some pretty big players back then, obviously, like Tim Schafer, Ron Gilbert, Dave Grossman. I mean, what was it like working with these proper legends? Uh, people uh, you... Well, they weren't at the time yet. Yeah, so, of course, yeah. Uh, so the legends at that time were more like the Eric Willmanders and the uh, Brian Moriarty's and the, uh, you know, David Fox and, yeah. and, and those folks, uh, because they'd kind of gotten the, gotten the whole games part of Lucasfilm started and they've done all kinds of creative stuff, you know, from bringing from Loom to Ball Blazer to, you know, Rescue on Fractal, it's all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so this is sort of the second generation, if you want to think of it that way. Um, I knew that Ron was kind of a quiet genius and that everybody really respected him. He was a super quiet. He's a spooky person to be around because he's so quiet and, and has a very intense stare. Mm. Um, and I knew that he was, you know, kind of behind the whole scum engine and that it would, you know, it had been multi-platform and everything and, and pro, you know, program for the PC on this other computer or you program for the cover from a, you know, a bigger microcomputer and so on. Um, Tim and Dave were a little more rebunctious. You know, Tim was just out of college himself at that point. Um, Dave was quiet and hilarious as he always is. He'll, he'll always be quiet and then he'll, he'll speak up and say something absolutely hilarious. Uh, Tim was funny. Um, there was a lot of, uh, Jokes out of him. I think by, by the time I joined, you know, and was playing Monkey, Monkey was already, you know, if you know anything about Monkey Island's history, there was, uh, it was originally a serious pirate game. Yeah, of course. And eventually at some point turned into a joke game. Um, and um, fitting more with the traditional LucasArts humor that had already been established at that point. Uh, so they were hard, hard at work on that. Um, uh, I met some people in the building who were already legends to me. Like the bigger legend that I met was um, Steve Purcell. Oh, yeah. uh, who's the creator of Sam and Max, and I love the Sam and Max comics. I'm a huge um, fan. And I knew yeah. him as an artist. Yeah. Uh, the other person I ran into briefly um, was Orson Scott Card. Uh, you know, I'd read the Ender's Game books and, and things by that point in time, Alvin Maker and things like that. Uh, he wrote the Sword Fighting Insult section for uh, for Monkey Island. Um, I don't know if people really know that very well, but um, he was kind of a jerk. Uh, he was very <laughs> cold. And we, he was kind of in and out. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the, the way the building was, it was a fairly small building. Um, I think there were a total of 60 people working there at the peak when I was there over those over that summer and then the next summer when I was testing Monkey 2. Uh, so it's just a summer job, and I got to kind of, you know, once in a while bring something up or go upstairs and demo how to reproduce this bug for a programmer. Uh, but mostly, mostly we were all kind of relegated to this, what we call the testing pit, which is this sort of inter- interior room that had, like, a door and no windows <laughs> with, like, 12 people and, and countless piles of computer equipment on it. Um, and that's where we tested. Fair enough. I mean, I've spoken to David Fox as well previously, and he he was a real pleasure to talk to. I have to say, and he spoke uh, very close, very you know, lovely about the atmosphere and everyone helping each other. Was would you agree? Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that was a kind of good atmosphere in the office? It was a good atmosphere. I mean, we had you know the the two or three people who hung out who hung out on the on the on the hint line all day talking to customers, and we had you know artists floating around, and and people was very. 
um, freewheeling and, and pretty friendly. I think the testers, we had a little bit of a inferiority complex because we were just the testers. Yeah. But um, people were involved in all kinds of different things. You know, it was a start of the game industry. Random things would come up. You know, oh, crap, we've got to ship all these boxes. Let's all get together in the warehouse and put disks in boxes for Monkey Island or, you know, assembling code wheels with a riveter. Um, so there were a lot, of, a lot of things that happened like that in a group of that small, of 60 people, where you're shipping multiple games. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just kind of winging it. It was the dawn of the game of the PC game industry. Um it's amazing how many games they put out and it's such high quality for such a small group of people. But um, yeah, a lot of, not a lot of egos. Um, I was spared most of the politics. There was some already going on at that point. Um, there were some inter-office, you know, romances and, and rivalries and weird things like that going on, which I, I kind of skated by because I was there for the summer um, and I was in high school. I was the youngest person there. Um, uh, technically, I, 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 am imp- I think I, well, I was until I left as a programmer, but when I came back, um, uh, when I came back after college as a programmer and I was hired, they were confused because my employee number was 17 and I had some existing uh, vacation t- time stored up. Right. Uh, so that tells me that in their system, I was, I was number 17 and that was, that seems about right for when they were leaving the ranch and how, just how small it was. Um, so I, I tested for that one summer. I was there for the next summer. So I think because I was gone and I was in college for that, that first year, I tested between my freshman and sophomore years of college as well. I think because I was gone that for, uh, that for that part of the year, I kind of had this sort of you know time lapse, fast forward view of everything, and I wasn't necessarily as mired in it as everybody else. So I, I didn't get quite as um, uh, embedded into the culture of the people there. I yeah. got a little bit more of a snapshot. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, out of all your, you know, did you ever get the chance to meet George Lucas? Uh, yeah, yeah, periodically. Yeah. Um, I mean, he would be around, you know, if you went up to have lunch at the ranch, you might see him eating lunch uh, with, with some guests. Uh, they had a very nice, very, very nice lunch at the ranch. Yeah. Um, he uh, he was always there for things like the uh, Scott Ranch picnic, was this gigantic, you know, kind of old style, country style. Fourth of July picnic with, you know, water balloon tots and, you know, face painting and all this kinds of stuff, big barbecue. Um, so he was there. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I brought my dad with me as my guest one year and that was horribly embarrassing because my dad, um, was desperately trying to get a picture of me with George Lucas in the background. And, uh, I remember walking, we were walking across the field at the end of the event and he's like, where do we pick up our bowls? They're like these bowls, you know, which was a potluck. It's like, where do you pick up our balls? And I'm like, oh, I think it's over there. And then I realized my dad's like spinning around us like paparazzi. Ah. And, and I felt horribly embarrassed. And then um, I ended up living in Marin County uh, when I came back from college. And I and I had just gotten the job there. And I, I was at the uh, the Renaissance Fair there. And I saw him. And uh, I was debating whether to talk to him. And I said I was going to talk to him and thank him, you know, for, for starting all this stuff and you know, where my job was and everything. And I said, uh, hello, George. And he kind of grunted at me and turned away. <laughs> <laughs> like he didn't want to be recognized he was with his daughter. Um, and then, you know, he'd see him around like Christmas parties and things like that. And I saw him once, uh, his, his, his daughter is like, she was like six or seven years old walking out ahead of him from this company Christmas party, carrying a poinsettia in each hand. And he had like three poinsettias in his arms. Like she was clearly going to take home and grow poinsettias looking very exasperated. And it was, it was kind of cute. Um, there's a, there's a kind of, you know, it's like the picture on the wall at the uh, at the Overlook, Overlook Hotel at uh, in The Shining. There's a there's a picture of all of us in the testing group there, uh, alongside George at the Christmas party, um, with, with all our dates and you know looking very fine. Um, so yeah, just just kind of kind of here and there. Um, when I was back as a programmer and working on Grim Fandango, he was he was pretty aloof from the company at that point. Uh, Lucas Arts was kind of he he always kind of looked at Lucas Arts as a way. I think Lucasfilm Games was sort of beneath his notice, and by the time it was LucasArts Games and was kind of games were kind of getting to be a big business, he saw it. He was trying to figure out like, well, why isn't this a merchandising, uh, merchandising vehicle for my for my movies? Mm. Um, and that's the point in time where things kind of shifted. We were making a lot more Star Wars games and things like that. That's right around the time that all the licensed stuff started coming out, like um, uh, Dark Forces or Jedi Knight, um, course, yeah, yeah. you know, Pod Racer, things like that. Um, so there's a big shift there. Um, but I mean, there was kind of a famous story from the. Um, the Dark Forces days, they were having him being interviewed for some show, and he was, you know, playing the game. He's like, it's just like, you know, playing through the movie. I really like it. And he was all excited, and they turned the camera off. He was like, <laughs> he, he really couldn't. You know, we always, Lucas Arts always felt like the redheaded stepchild of, of George Lucas. Like, he, he didn't really want much to do with this. Wow. Um, 
so yeah, it was kind of like existing kind of around and in the the shadow of the environment he made, but not really interact with him very much. Okay. Very, he himself is a very fairly quiet person. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, you obviously work. You've worked on loads of games, testing, actually working you know, proper program later on for LucasArts games. Do you have a personal favorite? Is there one you most enjoyed? Uh, me, me for me personally, it's probably Monkey Island, but I, 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 there, there, there's so many great titles. It's hard to choose for me personally. Um, I do love Monkey. I love sharing Monkey with people yeah. uh, who've never played games, never played adventure games before, and just the sort of sense of discovery and the sort of sarcasm in it. Um, I have a fondness for Grim Fandango, which is a little different. It's it's less from playing it and more from just sort of yeah. having so much myself in it. Um, I loved X Wing. Yeah, I mean, I I played X Wing to death, and uh, that was always the showpiece when I was in college. Everybody wanted to see how well X Wing ran on their computers. Um, let's see, what is from the time. Yeah, I think those those are the big ones for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were there were later ones that came out that were there were lots of fun. I, I mean, I have you know whole bunch of them here. Everybody got a copy of every game when they came out. And I still have my, my box copies of things, but um, I think those are my favorites. I like Jade the Tentacle. That's quite a, a lot cool. as well. Yeah, it's a classic. I like, I like Full Throttle as well. Yeah, Dave did, yeah. Dave did a good job. Good stuff. I can't... Yeah, they're all very good answers. Nice one. Um, <laughs> you started as a programmer. You built yourself up as a programmer and you eventually became the lead programmer. Is that correct? For Grim Fandango. <laughs> I mean, so uh, I kind of it's it's it, you make it sound like it's this long laborious like and I and I, I pulled myself up. It's really way more accidental than that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I I tested a second summer at LucasArts. Uh, tested on Monkey Two. Um, I finished college, and by the time I finished uh, a CS degree at Berkeley, I didn't think I was going to be a game programmer. I was like, okay, this is serious computer science, and games are sort of like that street. That's like just hacking and banging things here. That's not computer science, and and. Um, uh, I, I thought that I was going to be, you know, working at like Veritas or or some other company um, alongside my my classmates, and then uh, I just went for a visit up there sometime, and I I saw how much they were doing with 3D, mm. and I did have a class that was 3D graphics that I really did enjoy, and um, so I thought, you know, somebody said, well, you should apply here. I'm like, well, I guess I will. Um, so I did, and somehow in the course of applying, I really wanted to work there. Um, because they were, I did, I felt like I could bring like proper engineering and proper 3D graphics to this, you know, sort of crazy 2D hacky, you know, bitmappy place. Mm. And, um, so I applied and the interview process itself was kind of a, an interesting gauntlet. Um, and I came in on Grim Fandango and it had just started. Uh, Tim had a, what's called a five page treatment, um, for the game, which is basically like, you know, here's the, here's a sketch of my idea. Uh, not much else. Um, he had a lead um, animator and a lead uh, character artist uh, picked out. That was uh, Eric Anderson and Peter Sekel, respectively. And he had Peter Chan as his concept artist. Um, Peter Chan, by the way, the nicest person on the, not just in LucasArts but on the planet. <laughs> um, Peter Chan, very quietly, the uh, concept artist behind um, pretty much everything you've ever loved in, in games or movies. Um, you gotta look him up and, and see his uh, his CV. But um, really super sweet guy, very quiet, but a, a, like the most immensely talented person. Um, and there was no way he was not going to be doing you know concept work for new Star Wars or concept work for Pixar movies or whatever. Mm. Um, and so when I started, it was just us, and I was the, I was supposed to be the first programmer on the team. Mm. Uh, well, they were going to hire programmers later, or programmers going to free up from other projects as we got closer to production. Um, and uh, I was supposed to look at, like, what is the deal with 3D and LucasArts Adventure games? Because we wanted this to be a, a 3D game, and the Scum engine was all 2D, and so how would it take to adapt that and make it work? Mm. Uh, and I was supposed to come in and take a look at that, and I was very intimidated. Uh, I'd only ever programmed games workstations in here. I'm supposed to be working in, in Windows with Windows tools and all things I'm unfamiliar with, and taking part of Game Engine, which I'd never, never made a game. Yeah. And, uh, you know... Um, I mean, I suppose if you get into games now, you have plenty of game engines to start from, lots of open source to look at. We didn't have any of that. So uh, I hadn't made a lot of games. I, I'd done, you know, graphic stuff in college, but that's, you know, on, on SGI workstations, things like that. Um, and I just started, you know, we we were going through the pre-production phase where we were all kind of brainstorming puzzles and, you know, drawing things and sketching things and, and um, what would it be cool if and well, why does this character exist and 
um, you know, kind of sketching out the puzzle structure, everything that ended up in the, uh, in the Grim Fandango design document that Tim later released um, on the net, much to LucasArts' dismay. Mm-hmm. Um, that was all us. Like we had, you know, three and four hour sessions each afternoon where we, you know, whiteboard and in this tiny little room, um, and Peter Chan would sketch and then come in the next day and he's like, well, here's a sketch of, of this guy, this guy, Glottis. And it was like, no, he needs to be more like a hamster. Mm-hmm. No, he needs to be more like this, you know, crazy um, driver. And, uh, or here's this thing for the bone wagon. What do you think? Oh, more pipes, more pipes, and the engine should be popped up more. Um, so while we were doing all that, I was learning about um, Scum, uh, the, which is Scum is just the, actually the interpreter, the main thing that runs the game. The yeah. Game, the game. There's actually a whole family of tools around them, phlegm, bile, sputum, etc. They're all named after bodily humors. Or, <laughs> um, and I was learning about all that stuff, and it was, you know, it was a fully complete system. I went through what's what's called Scum U, uh, Scum University, where they, they teach people how to use Scum and write, write adventure games in Scum. I went there, through there with the the new crop of what they called Scumlets, the new the new programmers for Scum U. Um, among them, Chuck Jordan, um, uh, Chris Purvis, who was just coming up from the QA group. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was going through at the time. Um, and they, you know, if you look at Chuck, for example, he he has a wicked sense of humor. He's a great writer. That was his first job in games as well. He wrote banking software before that. I think he moved across the country to, to write adventure games. And uh, he has quite a I see if you look at like he, he went on to Telltale and wrote a bunch of stuff we've heard of. Hmm. Um, and I was having a really hard time. Uh, imposter syndrome kicked in pretty quickly. Like, what am I doing here? How do they? Why do they think I can do this? Um, I've I've accidentally deceived myself and deceived everyone, and, and I'm in a position I can't possibly do this. But I I plucked away, and, and there were there were other things that happened at the time. Like um, there was this amazing amazing de- demo PC demo called into the shadows, uh, that came out at the time. And, um, it had these, uh, these, these sort of real time lit 3d cameras of this dun of this skeleton in a dungeon swinging a sword around on, the, on these, between these torches. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was magnificent, but as all PC demos were, it was not indicative of anything. They actually make me over a product or game. It was just, you know, kind of showing off hardware. Um, but I was horribly intimidated by that because I knew I was supposed to make these games about skeletons. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. Like I, I, I could not do that. So if that's what we're looking at with these 3d skeleton game, I, I can't do that. And they're like, well, no, that's not the game we're looking for. It's going to be, you know, slower, different thing. Um, the game of reference for Grim Fandango at the time was biohazard, um, which was an alone in the dark style game. Oh, uh, I did that not, game. Yeah. 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 It's, it's little known. Yeah, um, I had it on my um, PC actually. I liked it, to say. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I liked it too. And and Biohazard was interesting. Uh, you, you, there was the puzzle where you had to like get the guy to cut off his arm by reaching through the gauge. That's like right. That. Yeah. Take this, take the arm and beat the other guy with the arm or something. I, really, quite inventive. But um, Biohazard was 3D and it was sort of alone in the dark style. It had it had fixed cameras and and um, fixed backgrounds and your character would walk around mm. and your character was you know just a. a a, a bundle of polygons you could probably count on two hands, but he had stretched over him textures, which is unlike uh, Alone in the Dark, which was solid polygons at that time, or mm-hmm. real polygons. Um, and uh, and so the notion, you know, Tim's idea for the art style for Grim Fandango, and even even thinking about uh, the sort of sort of um, the art style for the you know Day of the Dead, mm-hmm. came from looking at Biohazard and saying, okay, well these textures look all smeared and stretched. They look like somebody took a making a character out of cardboard boxes, stretched some nylons over them and then painted them, you know, with low res, mm. low res textures, you know, where do you find something that looks that rough? What, where does that arch, what fits that level of technical capability? And so he was looking at these little tiny, you know, day of the dead figures that are sort of hand painted and sort of, you know, have the skulls painted on, um, rather than trying to look representative of an actual skeleton. They're just sort of stylized. Yeah. And so that's where the idea to set a, set a game there was. And then he, you know, he'd done the treatment. The treatment was about like, okay, if this is what fits, this is an art style that fits, who's the coolest person to be? Because games are about wish fulfillment, which I still believe is very much like an underrated sentiment. Mm. Games should be about wish fulfillment. So who would you be if you were in this Day of the Dead environment? Well, you would want to be Death himself. And well, you know, but if you're all powerful Death, how interesting is that? Well, it's not very interesting. So let's make you, you know, Death is just an ordinary schlep going to his job. So that's kind of the, the genesis of of the Grim Fandango idea. But um, anyway, while we're doing all that, uh, I'm trying desperately to hide the fact that I don't know how to make games. Um, I mean, you know, in retrospect, I nobody did. 
at the time and they were all figuring it out and they may as well have picked a smart kid out of college as, as anyone else because it was it was all new. Yeah. Um, but I had people there to cop to crib from. So Rick Resco was there. He was the amazing graphics programmer. He did the Dark Forces engine and the and the renderer called Render Droid. It was in Jedi Knight. Um, there were people working on on uh, Outlaws as well. Uh, Lucas Arts had just gotten into a period where they were sort of modularizing the games. They were talking like, okay, here's a here's a component in that game. The sound system in that game is really good. Let's modularize it. Mm. The disc loading stuff in that game is really really good. Let's modularize it. And Jedi Knight was the first game that had really taken that to extreme. So everything in Jedi Knight was modular, plugged together, um, including Render Droid and, and the Love Letter Leia, things like that. Uh, and so I was faced with, you know, here's a pile of, I will call it legacy scum code that is sort of long in the tooth. I gone through a lot of different generations of, of adventure games. By that point, they'd done, you know, The Dig and, mm. and they'd done um, uh, all these different iterations across platforms. Uh, had done Day of the Talent Kill, had done Full Throttle, and, um, you know, was sort of tried and tested and true, um, but also being faced with, like, do something amazing. Like, do something that doesn't look like those games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And having to dig into it and sort of understand, okay, so how does this fit? Well, Speedum is this interpreter, and Scum is the is the is is actually the language. Um, it's the script creation utility for Maniac Mansion. It's all about, like, compiling scripts and making them into binary tokens. And then, like, there's an, the Speedum is the interpreter that runs the tokens. And, like, okay, Syst is the costume editor, and then, you know, Bile is the whatever, the you know. There's all these different things. And the sort of nouns, the, the sort of, like, what are the set of tools that were necessary to create these elements of adventure games? <clears throat> but at a certain point, I was looking at this thinking, like, okay, this is built for 2D. Mm. Um, every position in the world is, re- is represented by two numbers, X and Y, and they're integers, and they're integers that are in screen coordinates. Um, there's no floating point in here. There's no notion of 3D. There's, uh, you know, we're going to have to match 3D characters against 2D backgrounds. There's no notion of, you know, there's nothing. There's there's nothing 3D in it whatsoever, um, and so I had a I had to sit back one day and I said, geez, I'm dealing with so much debt here, and I'm I'm trying to keep you know they always kind of try to keep the engine functional so they could port games forward to it, which is really admirable. Um, Eric Holmander at the time was was sort of owning the uh, the Scum engine. Most of the other original Scum people moved on um, to um, Humongous Games by that point, um, and uh, so Eric was was uh, the keeper of scum. They called him the scum lord, the keeper of the scum, the scum code base. And he was sort of my mentor. Um, but if anything, I, I kind of rebelled just because I was so, like I just felt like I, I could understand better if I didn't have to kind of take into account yeah. everything that had been done for you know 10 years of adventure games by that point. Um, and and there were, you know, just to give you an idea, there, there were generations of programs before me that I didn't really understand at the time had been there who had tried to break from scum and do something different for adventure games. Oh, and really? um, so sort of things like in, in the X-Men games, there was this thing called story droid that was trying to do all the cutscenes there, uh, which was, you know, expected to grow up and be the replacement for scum and never did. Um, there was the, uh, the work to mash the, the um, insane engine, which was done for rebel assault. Uh, the movie player from that is called smush. Um, there was, there was an effort in full throttle to bring, insane into the scum engine that's how they did the sort of streaming backgrounds where ben throttles riding around on the on the roads um and that had kind of broken people like people had just shattered themselves on the need to both ship a game and make an engine at the same time i didn't know they'd done that and that it had been such a disaster for them and so i blindly did the same thing and i just happened to be successful um i uh I was looking at a lot of stuff and I was looking at the render droid and all the Jedi Knight stuff. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of libraries here. There's 3d uh, level editing, there's 3d character animation tools and, uh, and, and the rendering stuff that I'm all supposed to be sort of mashing this together with this scum engine to make mm-hmm. this happen. What is scum actually giving me? Mm-hmm. Right. At that point I had to really think like, what is scum giving me that isn't already in this game? Like Jedi Knight also has to handle bit maps. Yeah. You know, Jedi Knight also has to handle, you know, textures. Uh, Jedi Knight also has to handle, um, sound. Uh, so what what am I getting from using Scum? And so I, I took a really it was like one or I think it was one really long weekend, a long night on the weekend, and I kind of threw up a a proof of concept and I basically took all these different game components and I said okay I'm gonna I'm gonna render a background, I'm gonna have an animating bitmap that I just grabs I grab like a, a running dog animation from the bulldog from um, Full Throttle. Yeah. I'm gonna have that running in the corner. I'm gonna render a three character 
and um, be able to move him around with the keyboard. And the other thing I was looking for at the time was, so I, so I did that. I was like, okay, these are the, these are the hard bits for me. These are the things I don't know how to do hardware wise. Like these libraries were sufficient for me to get all these sort of elements on the screen at the same time, which I knew would be necessary to compose these scenes. And, um, I showed that to Tim and he was very excited, uh, because it was the first time I'd seen, you know, any of the dark forces or Jedi Knight stuff and not doing Jedi, Jedi Knight. Um, Eric was rather skeptical. He said, this is a bad road, but you can check it out for a while longer if you want. But I think you're underestimating the, the tooling and, and language support to come. He was correct. Um, but I blithely carried on. Um, at that point, I was friends with a programmer named um, Winston Wolf on the Jedi Knight team. He said, hey, you're interested in scripting languages, right? Uh, and I was like, yeah, I, I'd done, you know, compiler class at, at college and I'd, you know, written a compiler that, that understood a certain language. He's like, well, rather than writing around, there's this, there's this one in Dr. Dobbs this month. And Dr. Dobbs Journal was like an early magazine for programmers. And they had an article about Lua, this new programming language uh, from some research institution in Brazil that was intended to be an embedded scripting language. Yeah. And uh, at the time, it was one of the, it was open source. It was available on the internet. You could try it out, write it, you know, you read the magazine, you read the article, you go download it and try it out. So I did that just as a, you know, maybe this will work. And I found Lua to be delightful. Um, it, it had this incredibly small manual. Um, it, I think it built to 30 K without the interpreter or without the compiler. And then if you added the compiler, so you could dynamically generate code for it, I think it was like a hundred K or something like that. So it was really small. It could fit in an adventure game. It was quite fast. Um, I found it very forgiving in terms of syntax. Uh, and I was like, all right, well, let's see, what does it take me to get? An adventure game now. How do I take this this yeah. sort of collection of technical bits and make it an adventure game? So it's like, okay, for an adventure game, I need to be able to display text on the screen uh, for dialogue choices. I need to play some sounds. Um, I need to be able to run scripts and have things happen in response to things happening. So I actually just wrote the first sort of set of scripts in Lua to put up some text on the screen. Again, the text libraries were already there, but it was like, you know. Yeah. Taking a set of strings and saying, okay, but they make this a menu of choices. Now people go back and forth and change the colors, have it render correctly. And then if you pick something, have it appear over the character's head, centered in a box that you know, wrapped around to show they were saying it. And um, I wrote that all in Lua. And that was, again, the sort of proof of concept that, hey, this is this could actually work. Um, there were a few other stages like that that, that went along. Um, again, every time with me thinking I'd be found a fraud every single time, but it turned out this is just how you make games at the time people got challenged and tried something. And if you're, if you're smart and had no, no notion of how hard it was or that you think that everybody was likely to fail, that you, you might actually get something working. Um, so Eric, uh, quietly withdrew at that point and said, you know, with the sort of knowing look saying, I could see the path you're going down. I'm sorry to see it happen. I'm sorry. This game's going to fail and you're going to be crushed by it, <laughs> but go ahead. You have my blessing. I will be the scum Lord and you will be the person who makes Grim Fandango, whatever it is with whatever that is. <laughs> um, yeah. and, uh, he was right, but he was wrong. He was, he was right in that it was way more work than I expected in terms of like, ultimately you have to create a bunch of tools and pipeline for people to use, mm. not just the actual thing for the game itself. Um, and he was wrong in that it actually worked. And, and I think was a, was a fairly clean break and allowed us to do some really creative stuff. And, um, work with kind of the best tech available um, as opposed to, you know, kind of fitting into forward ported tools and things like that. Um, on the other hand, it put a lot more stress on, on me and the other programmer who came on the team to kind of make everything ourselves. Yeah. Uh, there were, there were two engine programmers on the team it was myself and Kevin Brunner who handed, who Kevin uh, ended up co-founding Te telltale games. Mm. Um, and, and what we ended up building, building tools for, for Grim Fandango. Um, I will say assist, uh, well, so the scum set of tools, sys, speedum, flem, file, etc. We kind of made an analog for almost each one of those. Yeah. Um, we had a, a level editor based on Leia, uh, which was the level editor built for for Jedi Knight, level editor for interior architecture, something like that. Um, something like that. Uh, we had hacked up that editor to you know run alongside, so you could have the game over here and the. And the editor was right next to it, another window, which again, like Scum was nowhere near having things, tools in windows that you could run at the same time. And they're actually connected together and talk in the same environment, um, which is kind of new at that time. I think Unreal kind of kind of uh, made that really solid in terms of like, you know, the, the workflow of like trying things in real time and, and rehearsing them and editing them and then spitting them out. Um, we had to make a costume editor. Uh, I initially built it in Delphi, which was the best, you know, 
Chuck Jordan, who's the only Windows programmer in the company that I really know of at the time, it's like, yeah, you should use Delphi for this kind of stuff. Um, and that was that was in Pascal. It was replaced very quickly by C++ Builder, or a Portland product at the time. Really awesome rapid prototyping tool for every window user interfaces. So we wrote our tools there. Um, artists were using Soft Image, so I had to kind of figure out okay, what are the formats that go into Soft Image. Um, how do I get the Z buffer out of that data? Out of that, how do I how do I get the camera data out? How do I get the um, the lighting data out uh, so I can reuse it in these scenes? Because even though they were using that to render the backgrounds, I had to figure out how to make that you know reproduce that in the engine so that the characters would be perspective correct as they moved around and be lit correctly and so on. Yeah. Um, and kind of whipped all that stuff together and. Um, you know, kind of made it do what it needed to do. Uh, the the costume editor had had always been for Scum as well. It was like, well, the character need the character X wear costume Y to do actions supported by that costume to do the correct animations. We, we have the same notion that you know a costume might consist of you know uh, a mesh and some animation which might already be loaded, but whatever the costume might involve, adding some different animations and some sounds and. Um, uh, a 2D bitmap, and so on. So, so we had because we had these, you know, very quickly we had these notion of the character's going to have to walk around behind things that are in 2D. Yeah. And the character's going to have to interact with things that are in 2D. So, um, the I think the next point where we kind of had a something that kind of gave people faith was there was a we had to make one room. So the first room we made was the the hallway in front of Manny's office with uh, Ava sitting behind the desk. Yeah. And so uh, that was a convenient one because there wasn't much for Manny to click behind. He was mostly in front of stuff, uh, which was a little <laughs> very convenient because I didn't have the Z clipping working very well at that point. Um, and we had Ava down the hallway typing, and so, so we had a little bit of spatial audio, like, you know, depending on where she was well, with the camera, we would attenuate the audio to make it sound like it's coming from over there and quiet so it's far away. And that was new in LucasArts games, wow. um, and, uh, or at least in the adventure games. Um, we, uh, we had Manny walking up and down. You could trigger him to walk forward and backward and turn. And I think I had his head working at that point. I, I kind of had, you know, there was no inverse kinematics. Was, the math was too hard for me. So I just, I took Manny's neck into three joints and I kind of split any angle I wanted him to look at. So I could have this fake IK to turn his head and look at things. And uh, he could look at things and trigger responses and, and he could go talk to Ava and trigger, trigger dialer choices. And that was the first room we built. Um, uh, there was some music playing in the background and it was almost... You know, looks pretty much almost like it chipped in the game, and that was like um, a real like people got super excited about the game once they saw that because now it, it didn't just look like well here's the elements of the adventure game but here's like a room in a game that you could actually say I want to be in that world. Um, so that was very very exciting. Anyway, in the course of all this, I somehow became a lead programmer <laughs> uh, because there were no other programmers on the project. Yeah. And I was just sort of making stuff work and. Assuming that somebody would come come in someday and tell me how to do it and how I was doing it all wrong, but fundamentally I was like just so furiously trying to keep up and and show that I could actually make something work at all. Um, at a certain point, it became well, you know, I guess he is the lead programmer because there's no other programmer. <laughs> He's leading himself. Um, uh, we did eventually get another programmer on here. That, that as I said, that was um, oh my gosh, I just based on his name. You know, I just said a minute ago, uh, founder co-founder Telltale Games, uh, Kevin Kevin. Yeah. Uh, per, um, Kevin came on and he he had made like some helicopter game where he flew around tunnels in a helicopter and he was dying to make adventure games. He took he, his interview. He saw one look at that screen. He was like, I would work on this game. I want to work. <laughs> Hire me now. And that game. Uh, usually when you're interviewing you, they're not sure which game you're going to go on. Like I was, I was, I was almost on Outlaws. That was, yeah. that was the game I was interviewed for. Um, and uh, so Kevin came on. He was the second programmer. He knew C++, which I didn't. Uh, so, so the game was kind of a mishmash of C and C++ along the way, as, as I learned it. And he, he already knew it. Um, he'd done a lot more 3D than me. Uh, he did some really clever stuff with the uh, the way walking worked in the game. We, we One of the biggest problems we had in the game until very late in development was um, uh, Tim really wanted you to be able to pull out your scythe at any given point in the game, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and the scythe is really big on screen. Uh, when, you know, maybe he flips it out and it's this big thing and he carries it around and it's like, okay, now it just clips through everything. So as Manny's turning around, this scythe is, the scythe is going through desks and walls and it, it looks like a mess. Yeah. Um, and so Kevin had this really clever idea of taking the walkable areas and when Manny pulls out the scythe, they shrink. So all, all the areas kind of, you know, they go on a diet, everything shrinks together to give extra clearance 
around it, you yeah. know, this buffer around Very clever. the walls. And then you pull up, and so if Manny's not standing in the new area, he first walks into the new area, so he's in a valid position. If he was, you know, if he was, if he yeah. was in a buffer, he's now in the valid area. He pulls out the scythe, and now all of a sudden he doesn't clip your thing. So wow. that was Kevin's brilliant hack at the end. Um, but he did all kinds of other, other things that were great. Um, we had to work out safe load with Lua. I had to do that. Um, I did all the all the multi, like making Lua multitasking so you could run multiple scripts in parallel instead of just one script uh, was quite a challenge. And I kind of I kind of backed into inventing some stuff there that was later later reinvented by other people. Uh, in things like stackless Python and, and Lua coroutines and things like that, that were I think Lua coroutines were directly inspired by it, but, but stackless Python was the same sort of problem of the you, you you want to switch the, the normal way a game uh, a language interpreter is written. There's a C program and it kind of switches to the game logic. It goes back to the C program and goes back to the game logic, and it's kind of one to one to one. But um, the game logic has to call back into the game to 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 do things. Yeah. So it's kind of you get C and then Lua and then C and then Lua and then C and Lua and then all of a sudden it's like oh but switch because it's time to switch frames or there's a pause wait for the next frame in the game script and then you're you're supposed to switch back over to the next thing that you're running and, and run that but maybe that was only C Lua was the state it was in and so you have like this mismatched sort of stack of of calls between the the, the game engine and the interpreter and then. You know, one next to it that's not the same depth. And how do you do that? So I, I did this stuff in Lua to to flatten that out, so you never you're never more than one level deep. Yeah. And therefore, you could actually switch between them, and that was that was quite t- challenging technically. And I I um I pulled it off. I wrote up a, I wrote a lot of this up for the um the Lua mailing list and it's out there on the net. But um saving and loading the same sort of thing. It's like okay, this game was not really written with save this this language is not written to save and load at the same time uh, expected. So how do you do save load? You know, what's the state of this? Interpreted language and how do you jump it out? So had to invent a lot of stuff along the way. Um, didn't really know how hard it was, and didn't nobody told me I couldn't, and nobody told me I, you know stop it. And somehow we made a game. No, it's, that's it. The, le- the level of detail that I really appreciate, it, Brett. That is an absolutely incredible story. Uh, I don't want to. I mean, it don't, I don't want to sound rude, but it all, it's unbelievable. The game was made in a way that the amount of things you had to go through. Um, yeah. I mean, it could have been made with the Scum Engine at, at the start. Was that the original plan then? Grim Fandango, Scum Engine, but in 3D. Scum Engine, but with 3D characters. And yeah. did you did you dub it the is it the Grime Engine or the Grimmy Engine? Yeah, I called it the Grime Engine. Grime um, engine yeah. For Grim, Grim Engine, because um, you know Scum had it was for Maniac Mansion originally, even though it was never used for Maniac Mansion later. Yeah. Uh, so I called it Grim Engine, and I think, well, okay, they're their bodily humors all be grime and I'll, I'll come up with some dirty names for these things later. <laughs> grime smudge, you know, things like that. But, um, yeah, it was the grim engine. Um, the, uh, the costume editor was called the, called chortle. Mm. I like laughter. Yeah. Um, C H O R T L E. Um, which was just short for chore tool, which was short for choreography tool. <laughs> yeah. So the choreography tool, which was all about like, you, know, you could load up a character and like rehearse, you know, Play this chore, and you'd watch the character do the animation. The bitmaps would flip, and you could put footstep markers in for where sound should, should be emitted, or um, things like that. Uh, the chore tool was kind of the masterpiece. I think that was that was the thing I was probably most proud of um, in terms of tooling that didn't exist. And um, another another thing I did, which, so I was proud of that one because it was literally like it was a DLL. So it's so like a tester was having a problem downstairs. They could re, they were reproducing the bug. Mm. I could go downstairs, drop the latest version of the chore tool DLL directly into, into the thing, press the key in the game. It would load up the DLL and bring it up next to it. And I could, you know, say, watch this character and I could see his, his chores and his animations pop up. I said, oh, there's the problem right there. And you, you could see it right away. Similarly, you know, you could say, oh, you know, they reproduced the problem. Okay, pop up um, an editor for the script. And then, you know, okay, I could like re-edit the script and like say feed the script to the engine and like fix the bug right there and say, okay, this is definitely going to fix it. Take it back upstairs, commit that code. Um, so there's some stuff that was really, really good for sort of live code ed- live on the fly re-editing of the code that the game was running in, um, in the interpreter and live um, rehearsing. You could, you could isolate a bug and like bring it into the editor and, and do it right there. Um, that stuff was really cool uh, and I think pretty new at the time. Uh, other people did it, but it was, it was sort of a new set of methods that were available to game developers that weren't there before. Um, another thing I did that was kind of a, a crazy hack um, that was kind of miraculous that it worked, um, uh, lip sync in the game. Yeah. So if you looked at any previous adventure game, um, 
you know, they start out with just text and then they go and record the dialogue and then they come back and now the dialogue has to work. So um, they either had no lip sync, which is the case for most adventure games, mm. and the animators had a trick where they would just animate the character saying watermelons. Oh, really? And so that we, yeah, if you go look, <laughs> look at any of the old look starts adventure games and just like turn off the audio while the character's talking and just watch for them to be saying watermelons, 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 watermelons. <laughs> that's what they're doing. Um, so their mouths kind of jabber while they're talking. It's all watermelons, 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 because that sort of exercises all the different phonemes right. in a reasonable order. Yeah. Uh, and so they kind of jabber that way, and that way it's not just, it doesn't look just like random. Um, and then uh, later they had some that would try and use the audio amplitude and frequency to pick up a bow shape, and those look just crazy weird. Mm. They don't don't even look as good as just saying watermelons, watermelons, watermelons mm. over and over. Um, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to get actual lip sync data in there. And, um, well, I, I, yeah, there's so many things I did. There's <laughs> okay. So, so the scripts, uh, Tim ended up writing most of the scripts. There was, this is a game there was, it was very contentious in the game where he did not let the other scriptures in the game, write the dialogue. And that was very contentious. He and Chuck did not get along at all, at all well for that. Cause Chuck was there to write dialogue. Hmm. Um, but um, we wanted the voice acting to be really good. And so the voice acting always happened in L.A. And it was this voice producer named Dara. And um, you, you would give Dara, like, the extract of text from the game. So at a certain point, you wrote all the text. The text was locked. Extract the text. They just had these lines of text. Dara would take down to Hollywood. And he would go in a recording studio with the actor, the voice actors. And they would read these lines. And often the character... Like, they only had one or two shots. They'd have, a, like, a pickup where they could go and re-record some lines, but sometimes they didn't because the actor wasn't available or they were out of money or whatever. And so often the actors were not in the room together at the same time. Yeah. And they had no context for what they were reading or why. And so you see this most in Sam and Max. Um, there's, this, there's this, you know, one of the things that's great about Sam and Max is that whenever you look at something, there's always, a, you know, a funny line for something to look at. And often the other, you know, you're doing it as Sam, and Max will respond. And... Um, Sam says, like, I don't know what I'm looking at, or, or something like that. And Max always says, I don't know where I am, Sam. <laughs> and it's like, he emphasizes the wrong syllable in the sentence. Hmm. And it was just a, it was, it was strictly down to the fact that the two voice actors were not ever in the same room, and they had no context for how these lines would be read, where the emphasis should be. So Dara would go down, he'd have them recorded in several different ways, and then when he came back, they, they picked the one that seemed to fit the best. Um, we did things different on Grim Fandango. Um, I, because I had so much control over the scripting language, I, I, I used a I made this ridiculously Harry Pearl script that it would extract all the dialogue from the game, but it knew things about it. Like the dialogue came from the file representing this set and it involved these two characters going back and forth. And there were these markers, these function markers around that stretch of dialogue. So I knew it was like, okay, here's an exchange between these characters. Um, and so I actually had it extract the text, but not just make a bunch of text lines. Uh, my brother was a screenwriter. I knew what a script was supposed to look like. So I had it actually create an HTML. And the web was, hey, we have web browsers on desktop. This is an amazing thing. It was Windows 95. Yeah. Um, or not Windows, not even not Windows 95 at that point. It's Windows. Uh, no, Windows. Yeah, it was Windows 95 by the time we were shipping. Um, and we had a web browser. It's like, okay, I'm going to render an HTML version of a Hollywood script. Hmm. And so it would have, like, you know, interior, Rubicava Casino, um, and then it would have, you know, the characters say their lines, and I had them actually like, you know, here's the character, then there's, the, so you could actually see the flow of the lines between the characters. And Tim was like, well, I know how they're supposed to sound there, so I'm gonna put a comment. If you ever see a comment above a line of text, that comment is a stage direction. And so I actually extracted that, so it'd say like, you know, softly, or, you know, wistfully, or, you know, angrily, and things like that. So Tim was able to like, in the code, we would extract it out, but it would appear in this, in this, you know, speaking script with full stage direction. And so Dara was able, oh, and, and then I was able to take it and say, okay, I'll cross-reference this and I'll make a speaking script for each of the characters. So each of the characters only has a script contained, you know, the scenes with them and yeah. their lines in it. And then I also cross-referenced said, okay, which characters have scenes together? And Dara was able to use that to schedule the actors to be in the studio at the same time. Wow. <laughs> so in Grim Fandango, you had actors that were in the studio at the same time, reading from a script they were totally familiar with, with stage directions, responding to the other person in the room. Um, and that's part of why the dialogue uh, in Grim Fandango works so well and with so much expression and such great acting. Um, and I was very, very proud of that. That was, that was a really big thing. The other thing is that when we got that back, so all these, these all come back, like every, every 
every line of text has a number associated with it. As, it, as they extract the text, you leave a number. And then the files come back and it's like, here's file name number X. And it's like, okay, so if I want to see this line, how do I check that out? And so what I did is I, um, I rewrote the script that extracted the, everything and w wherever there's a line in the script, I replaced it with a URL to the local file name that corresponded to it. So you could spin through this whole shooting script and click on any line to hear it. And so you could like scrub through these dialogue scenes and say, oh no, no, there's a line that doesn't work there. I need to re-record that one. Or we're gonna cut that one or whatever. Um, so it was this great way of exploring like all the assets that had come back from this recording session. It was really, really great. Um, and then the last bit I did on the dialogue stuff, I thought was really important. And by the way, like I skipped the whole part where like I came up with a whole bunch of puzzles and like I worked <laughs> with them on you know the whole structure of the game and characters and things like that. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I have it. I have an. I think it's assistant designer or associate designer, something like that, credit on it. But I think it, it underrepresents how much Peter Sakel and Eric Anderson and Peter Chan and myself actually were in that room with Tim. But mm. you know, Tim wrote all the dialogue, but we all kind of made the game world and all the puzzles and structure. Um. The uh, the. The other thing I did with the dialogue was I wanted the lip sync to work. So like, once you have this amazing dialogue and they're all saying watermelons, it really kind of sells it short. Mm. Um, we had gestures like shrug or point and things like that that the scripters could put in, but I didn't feel it was good enough. So I did something kind of ambitious and kind of stupid, and I don't know why I had time or thought I had time for this. Um, but at the time, do you remember uh, Clippy, Microsoft Clippy? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so Microsoft had this idea that uh, virtual assistants were going to be a big deal. Like everybody's going to want to make these virtual assistants and there's going to be a whole bunch of them. So Microsoft made this thing called the agent SDK for, you know, virtual agent SDK. And it had Clippy and it had a little Einstein and it had a little rocket, you know, oh, I remember, yeah. little, exa little example characters. And the agent SDK basically had a way for you to kind of supply the images. Um, it was like a, it was like a very simple version of my chore tool to some extent. It's like here, you know, supply the animations that represent different actions and then you could, um, for whatever reason, somebody at Microsoft said, hey, we've got this phoneme recognition library and we can generate syllable data to have the animations drive these characters as they, as they you know, so that when you have them uh, text to speech this, uh, this, this text that the person writes in for their agent, yeah. that the character would actually look like they're speaking in. And the animation was like really poor, but I looked at the SDK and it was like, okay, it has this tool where you can, load in a wave file and then you can type in a line of text and it would run some analysis to figure out okay where are the points are the phonemes in this mm. you know if i was going to play this this wave file you can use the international phone phonetic alphabet or something like that ipa um where would i start these different phonemes like what so basically what you got is um when you spit it out, it would be a wave file, which would still be a wave file, but at the end, it would have this extra chunk of data. They were basically a list of time codes and, and phoneme symbols. So that basically told me, okay, this is like my my closed captions for this thing. I, I now know as this wave file plays along, here's the point in time where they should look like they're saying E. Yeah. Here's the point in time where they look like they're saying O. And here's the time they should look like they should be saying F. <laughs> and so those are all the mouth shapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had the animators make, um, make sure everybody had the, those syllables, those international phonetic alphabet symbols that were, every character had those in their costume and they were called, you know, A, E, F, O, U, things like that. And um, I ripped out the data and I synced this one line. It looked just spectacular. Mm. It looked like the character was saying the line. Um, and so then the problem I had was that it was not, it was, in the, it was in the SDK, but it was a tool. It was something you ran by hand and we're supposed to click and you, know, you have to load up one line at a time. We had 8,000 lines of dialogue. Um, so I actually wrote something called zombie typer and it was basically just like a macro recorder. You would do this, you know, in a fraction of a second with a macro recorder today, but I wrote something that was basically special purpose to like run through, like grab the, you know, <laughs> open the file and then type in the words and then like click this and then wait until this happens and then click that and then save it out and then clip off the end of the data and put back. And we ran that and it, it, um, we left it running for a couple days to do all 8,000 lines of dialogue. I basically just manipulated, you know, abused Microsoft's tool and the fact that they packaged up that capability to just get out the data I needed. Nice. Um, and I think of all 8,000 lines of dialogue, it would, it would it only failed on like 70 or 80 of them. It was pretty good for the time. Wow. Um, and so I did that. I put it all in the game. And so now you have this lip sync in the game. And unfortunately, they did not do it for the foreign language versions of the game, um, which were all done, you know, aftermarket or after I'd left. Yeah. Um, so it's really only in the English version that it has that. In the, in the other 
language versions, it falls back to saying watermelons. Right. Um, and so that made the game, you know, there's a, there's a point in line where, where Manny is, uh, is joking with Chowchilla Charlie or, or, or threatening him or something like that in the, uh, in some cafe, Chowchilla Charlie's in the booth. And, uh, or, or no, it's with Maximino. Manny's talking to Maximino, the, the casino boss. And Maximino's going, <laughs> and Manny goes, <laughs> he had, you know, kind of that line. And he does it perfectly. And the line comes and he goes, whoo, and he makes that O sound. Oh my God, it looks so good. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yes, this is great. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the other languages don't have that. The other thing that happened is um, the, uh, the game came out and there were a lot of deaf people who were complaining because there's, there's this great scene where Pilatus plays this song called The Rusty Anchor. Mm-hmm. We, we were going all the time. There's always red herring rusty anchors everywhere. What could rusty anchor refer to? And Pilatus has a song called The Rusty Anchor, and it's kind of this big, you know, little, little song hidden in the game uh, where Glottis plays the piano and Glottis has this gigantic flappy head. And so when his, his I had no lip sync data because all I had was the audio of the, um, of him singing the piano and him singing was all one file. Yeah. And so I had no lip sync data for that, but Glottis big flappy head doing watermelons for five minutes while you listen to this thing was not good. Um, and uh, it was missing. Um, the text extraction hadn't worked for it either, and so the, it didn't have text. And so, so there were some deaf people who played the game who complained that they, they had no idea what Claudius was singing, and so they couldn't get anything out of the song and the jokes and things like that, and they were very, very unhappy. So when we did the patch for the game, I resolved that I was going to go back and I was going to put in... I did That, that part was like hand-generated. Like I yeah. literally went back and I, like, I clipped all the lines, and I put in the phoneme markers myself, and like actually did like an animator, like actually fit the phonemes. So I actually did that one by hand. Um, and I felt pretty proud of that one too because again it looked it looked really great because Glass does the same thing he'll go ooh rusty anchor and you'll see him his mouth kind of goes ooh rusty anchor and it goes like that um, it didn't do that before and it, it looks really good um, so yeah I mean I mean there's this I, I look back on it really fondly as like nobody told me I couldn't and there was yeah. nobody else who knew what they were doing or and there was nobody else available and so fundamentally you just end up Okay, I got this problem. How am I going to solve it? Um, I think if I had a lead programmer, I probably would have done a better job directing me to sort of more solvable problems, or yeah. you know, and they sort of what what, what Ray Gresko would call Chrome. This is Chrome, you know, all the stuff I just described with all the lipstick. That's all Chrome. It's not necessary to shift the game. Yeah. Um, but I spent, you know, I got I got to spend a lot of my time on that myself. Um, the game broke us. It broke us. It was a three year production. It was very long. Yeah, uh, went on much longer than anybody expected for production. It we had cut the game twenty five percent at the very beginning because we thought it was going to be too big, and it was still too big a game. Yeah. Um, we were all exhausted, uh, burnt out. Um, team, you know, when the game came out, team just went their separate ways and didn't want to talk to each other for a few months. Yeah. Um, really difficult production. <laughs> <laughs> Some amazing, amazingly difficult to reproduce bugs that they that were fixed at the last minute. Um, it's Big sound. confrontations in the office. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember at a certain point, I was like, you know, Tim. Tim kept changing things. Like, we, like whenever something fell out of QA, he would actually not just fix the bug, but actually fix things that he also wanted to fix, and that he, that you know, he was chroming on his own. And we were like, no. Every time you do that, it's a risk of more bugs, and it's going to fall out of QA again. And it yeah. kept falling out again and again and again because we'd find these crash bugs. And Tim kept changing things, and and. At one point, I was like, "I can't do this anymore." Like, whatever, you know, whatever the game is, we got to ship it like this. This is it. This is the game we made. And Tim was like, "No, it's my game, and we ship it when I say it's done." Yeah. And you know, if you want to give up, that's on you. And we did. I mean, we we're exhausted. We couldn't work anymore. We've been working, you know, eighty-hour weeks, and we we're just exhausted. I remember um, the game was in QA and. Half Life had just come out, yeah. Which you know we lo- we were nominated for best game of the year and best audio and best best animation, everything all over the place all year, except they were nominated in all the same categories as Half Life, and Half Life won all of them and we lost all of them. <laughs> uh, so Half Life really stole our lunch in, the, in terms of awards. Um, 
But uh, we watched Half Life, and it was like, wow, this is amazing! Like the, the opening scene of Half Life with the, the machine going haywire. It's a great game. Let's be honest. Yeah. It well, it was to me. It was like, okay, this is the future because we'd had lots of first person shooters, but none of them had integrated storytelling into the game itself. Yeah, agree. Into the environment, and uh, and that to me was like, okay, right into the wall for adventure games. This is it. You know, it's it's gonna it's the interactive storytelling inside a three D world, yeah. not just the graphic adventure and not canned. That's there. Um, I mean, the first moment where a head crab, you know, kind of scuttles around a corner, kind of happily, and then all of a sudden leaps at your face, and, and Half Life is, is a screaming moment. And, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, but I remember Half Life had just come out, and we we're like, "Oh shit!" You know, <laughs> get this get this game out before graphic adventures are done. And then um, the other thing is, uh, Chris Purvis, who was there, was a super car racing fanatic, car fanatic, and um, Grand Prix Legends had come out, which is an amazing technical achievement of game. And I just remember we set up Grand Prix Legends and we were all excited about it and we were too tired to play it. Yeah. Like we were just we were just so exhausted. So there's these beanbags in the room. And I just remember we would sit in these beanbags and watch Grand Prix Legends on a demo loop, just sort of race itself around the track and just like just stare, like waiting, <laughs> like on call in case the game fell out of QA and couldn't go home, but sort of dozing off in these beanbags and then, you know, we all had our game beers at that point, we'd all grown beers at the end. Um so yeah, it was um, it was pretty rough. It's pretty rough. It sounds like a re- uh, really interesting chapter in your life, Grim Fandango. I don't understand. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Google is listening to our conversation. Yeah, no. Um, it, it, oh, Brett, you, 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 you must look back with some pride, but obviously it's, it's bringing back some pretty intense memories as well. Is that fair to say? It's very intense. Yeah. Um, you know, games are not easy. Mm. Uh, They've become, you know, at that point it was a miracle we could actually have, you know, two game engine programmers and three scripters and, you know, a team of 20 artists and animators make a game like Grim Fandango. You could actually be a single person and have a huge influence on what actually came out of the game. And game teams right now are huge. They're oh, gigantic. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and they're risky and they're expensive and, you know, with good reason. People take, they're very cautious with them. Uh, Grim Fandango is a big risk. Mm. Um, it was... You know, when we walked away from the game, when it finished, I had no idea if it was good anymore. Like, I was like, does this game suck? Is this game good? I have no idea. Uh, I I think I've only ever played through Year 4 once on my own. Like, actually played it all the way through. Oh, really? Uh, just because I couldn't, I couldn't stand to look at it anymore. Yeah. Um, and I kind of thrown everything into it. And so when I came, I was on the next game. I was on Escape from Monkey Island. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, we were doing some new tactical challenges there and working with, you know, Mike Stemley and, and Sean Clark. It was very exciting, but I, I didn't have my heart in it. I, I kind of poured everything I had in Grim Fandango. I'd worked myself. I just exhausted myself. And I, I don't think I had, I mean, I, I had this sort of pride and pride in craftsmanship, but that you, despite all that, all the sort of things I had to kind of make on the fly, but you know, I, I, I sort of had touched every part of the game from the game design document to yeah. um, the game engine and the tools and then this voice stuff. And I kind of had a lot of hands in it. And then when it came to escape from Monkey Island, I was, programmer and there were other people there to help me but I you know I didn't I didn't have anything to do with the game design um it just wasn't the same um mm. and I, I felt like I literally I think I I think this is the case I had one game in me and it was Grim Fandango I mean um, there are worse games to make than Grim Fandango it is a brilliant game I, I'm a huge fan and this you should be you should be proud Brett <laughs> yeah well I mean I am and, I, and it was it was Tremendous for me. I was at E3 when they announced. Uh, I was working at Sony at PlayStation, obviously. Uh, when they announced they were doing Grim Fandango Remastered on, yeah, on yeah, PS4, yeah. and um, I was there at the. You know, I've been to many many E3 press conferences with PlayStation by that point, and I was sitting in you know top of the nosebleed seats in the auditorium. Mm. And when they, you know, they've been doing game after game after game, and when they announced that game and they started playing the music. And the Peter Chan concept art up on the game, the Black Hole concept art, the place erupted, yeah. like blew the roof off the place. And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> people actually!" I mean, I knew I knew it had won awards, but I thought this is a game that's going to get forgotten. Mm. The, you know, it wasn't that a ton of people played Grim Fandango, but it influenced those who played it, and a lot of them were in the game industry later, or yeah. people in the game industry played it one way or the other. And so it was this amazing reaction in that in that auditorium, and I was very excited about that. So. Uh, it was great to go back and sort of, you know, a lot of the same stories I'm telling you. I had to go back and tell, but more to a more technical audience, double fine. So they're like, well, how does, what the hell is the engine doing here? <laughs> like, do you still have the art for this? And I managed to walk away with, you know, CDs full of discs, full of source code, which they were, they were delighted to have. 
even though I kind of recreate the engine, but, um, and it was, you know, a lot of walking down memory lane, but it took, it took me, you know, probably, probably 10 years to, <laughs> to be able to remember fondly the, the good parts of the challenge and not, and, and not just think of, oh my God, that was the point in time when I, you know, my health and my sanity, and, you know, <laughs> were at risk, um, and crunch, you know, and, and having so much sympathy for people in crunch, the game industry, because that was a game where we did like an entire year in crunch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm proud of it, but it's, um, it definitely felt like something I couldn't repeat. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, when I went to PlayStation was kind of the, like more at the platform level hub of the industry kind of stuff. I was faced with like, well, what, you know, after this, I want to work at a game studio. And I was like, oh, God, I never want to be on a game like that again, ever, if I could help it. And the game industry, you know, is notorious for not having good engineering practices and any other crunch a lot. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I, yeah, I never, I never made another game. I mean, I contributed to the games. I, I have programming credits on other games that I helped out on while I was there. Uh, when I was at PlayStation, I have credits from helping people, you know, sort of sure. uh, on the PlayStation side as the game as they're working on the games. But yeah, it was it was um, my credits are basically as a tester on a bunch of other adventure games, and then you know, lead programmer and assistant designer on Graham, and that was it. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a. I mean, I know every there's a lot of passionate creation and game stories out there, but it was a true passion project for everybody on it. It was, um, it was a monster. It was a, a monster that consumed us, but that we threw everything we had into. Um, I think we, we all broke ourselves on it. So I really appreciate your honesty, Brett. Um, yeah. you, you went to Sony, obviously you, you, you were there for a while. Did you, did you enjoy working at Sony? You know, how different was it compared to Lucas, Lucas Arts? So I was a Sony for 16 years. Wow. So <laughs> Quite a long time. time. Yeah, I was a, I was at LucasArts for, I think, five years yeah. uh, and and, and uh, Sony for 16. So it took me a while to, to think of myself as the Sony person, not the LucasArts person at yeah. Sony. Um, I went over there to work in their R&D group um, for PlayStation 2. Uh, I was very interested in PlayStation 2 because I was a Linux fan from back in college and um, more 3D, more math, uh, which is sort of my background from college as well. Um, so I was very excited. I worked in the R&D group there. Rapidly ran to imposter syndrome right away there. Incredibly brilliant people. Um, but it was a tough point in time where Phil Harrison would be like every other week, Phil Harrison would, you know, they had, the R&D group and PlayStation had like a hand scanner for all the high tech stuff. And they're like, oh, you, you have, they have, we, we have, we're so high tech. We don't have cards that you swipe. We have a hand scanner. Wow. It like, <laughs> uh, but it was all kind of for show to like, to like the, the top screen R&D labs. Yeah. Um, but imposter syndrome took off right there. I, I had the, um, I had the first, as far as I know, first PlayStation Two development kit shipped to North America. Wow! Um, arrived the same day I started, and they put it on my desk. Like, okay, the new guy will set that up and get it going. Um, and it, you know, when I say first development kit, I mean like it's literally like a bunch of hand soldered boards, like in a bread, a bread case, like <laughs> flexing and like bar- you know vibrating and like you know yeah, yeah. barely held together. And uh, the first thing I was supposed to do on it was update the firmware, and I somehow bricked it. <laughs> I completely bricked it. Oh, nice. And so, like, on the very first day I was there, I, I had the imposter syndrome where I was like, oh, my God. And, I, and, and the fir- first impression I left with everybody was that I screwed up a, a dev kit, the one dev kit. <laughs> um, I think there was two. Yeah, was one yeah. of the two. There was one functional one, but they had to send it back to Japan. Um. And I was working with these brilliant people, Stuart Sargason and, and Rick Marks, who went on to do iToy and all the PlayStation VR stuff, mm. um, and, uh, and Attila Vas and, and Gabor Negi, like these brilliant, brilliant, you know, Hungarian odd couple that made all this crazy stuff. Um, Tyler Daniel did haptic interfaces, crazy stuff. And everybody was doing their own kind of R&D, you know, and they were like, I've done R&D. And I was like, I made a game, one game, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And I like what I discovered is that I, if you take R and D as research and development, I'm I'm really terrible at the R and I'm really good at the D. Oh, nice! Like, <laughs> like I, I I will make tools, I will make you know make files, I will I will you know write libraries for things, but I'm really terrible at like just like here's this amazing demo of a concept. Mm. It doesn't that isn't that amazing? Let's fund that and do go research later, and then we'll make it a product someday. Mm. Um, and so Phil Harrison was the uh, was the head of. VP of tech at the PlayStation, I think, at that point. And, um, you know, every other day he would have somebody from Newsweek or Time, you know, some reporter coming in with him and he would sort of 
here's the R and D group, and and um, he'd be going down like you know Craig Reynolds is next to me, like showing this flocking algorithm that's all amazing, and he'd be going down like one by one, demoing them, and then he'd come to me, he's like, and what you're, what are you working on? I, what I was working on was um, cartoon rendering, like non photorealistic rendering. Yeah, uh, Disney movie Tars gonna come out, and I thought, like, okay, we can do that in games. Like we should be able to do like painted looking backgrounds mm-hmm. that are fully 3D. Um, and I never had it working. <laughs> like every time they came by for a demo, I, it was always broken. It was always in some state. And Craig, when I when I later flushed, I, I'm going to tell you, I actually flushed out the R&D group into the into developer services, which turned out to be a match made to heaven for me. Yeah. Um, Craig told me he's like, like, always have a working version. Like you can always like there always has to be a working demo, even if it's a, a poor demo. Yeah. It's better that than like I can't get it working. And so we got to the point in time where Phil would like bring people along, and he would just sort of quietly skip my cube and go <laughs> next to one. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is so horrible. <laughs> and then uh, they said they need help over the developer services group or developer support group. So I ended up switch, switching over there. And that was perfect for me. It was like, you know, yeah. it was right at the intersection of helping people. I really loved, I loved helping the artists at LucasArts, mm-hmm. um, making tools for them and so on. Um, I loved, you know, uh, the, the development kit was Linux based and I actually knew Linux really, really well. So I was like, you know, the people there didn't know anything about Linux. I was able to do that really well. Um, and then it was a, it was like a dial up. Uh, dial up BBS who dial into to download the SDK versions. I was like, this is crazy. The web exists. Why isn't there a website? Yeah. So I ended up making a website for it. That became PlayStation DevNet. And then I ended up managing the group, but not because I would have any management skills, but just because I seem to actually have a notion of what support should look like and um, kind of willingness to do this stuff. And so that was, again, sort of a, you know, you don't necessarily know what you could do until, if people don't tell you no. Um. So I kind of reverse engineered SourceForge. I said, oh, this could be good for, I just learned, you know, I'd never taken databases or any web programming, but it's like, oh, mm-hmm. I took apart SourceForge and I can see how it works. And oh, I got a database running and oh, this is how it works. And this is how you're, you know, secure it. And so I set up all that stuff and, and DevNet, I ended up kind of reverse engineering myself in a web development program and, um, and ended up being a manager for like the people creating DevNet and the people who are using it to, to help developers. At one point I ran a strategy group, which was also working on things like, you know, like PlayStation VR or the yeah. or the um, the uh, Move controller and things like that. Oh, nice! Uh, but I, I I was responsible for that at a certain point. Um, I was managing the group and PlayStation Three delivering PlayStation Three was really hard, really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I always warned people. I said, you know, PlayStation Two. We got a lot, we got away with a lot because we were first to market and had this huge install base, but people didn't seem very happy. And I said, you know, the moment that we don't have the leading install base. People are going to drop us like a hot rock. I'm like, oh, no, they love the <laughs> PlayStation. And PS3 came out. It was like, it was really hard to develop for, and Xbox yeah. was way easier. Yeah. And people were like, like, sorry, we're not going to do it. <laughs> like, it got to the point where like, we had one, one developer tell us that they're, they, they had a, an engineer who was going to quit rather than work on PS3 because it was so hard wow. and, so, and the tools were so crappy. So the lead-up to PlayStation 3 launch was really, really hard. And um, at that point, I ended up... Um, um, sort of starting this advisory panel process mm. because fundamentally we were, you know, all the engineers would be, we'd be the support engineers would be talking to Japan saying, you know, we really need to fix this. People are really struggling with it. And Japan didn't seem to care. And they were all working on the Blu-ray stuff and like, look, you can't make games on this thing. <laughs> it needs to be a game, game console before a Blu-ray player. Sure, yeah. um, and so they're having a really hard time. I'm like, okay, maybe they, they won't listen to us. Maybe they'll listen to developers firsthand. So we need firsthand information from developers and uh, we ended up convening our first advisory panel um, early in December, the uh, the month the PlayStation Three shipped. Right up, right after that, um, we brought in for sort of the technical leads from all the sort of launch games. Uh, so some were from EA and some from Activision and Ubisoft and some from you know smaller studios. And uh, we put them all in one room at the Ritz Carlton Half Moon Bay, which is a beautiful kind of seaside thing with this you know gorgeous crashing waves on the rocks. And, yeah roller golf courses and stuff. We had this huge breakfast spread out and um, they all kind of rolled to the room and kind of all started relaxing. And uh, so we started the meeting and they said, uh, one, of the, one of the guys from Colin from EA said, uh, so is this your way of apologizing, man? <laughs> and, uh, and he was absolutely right. Um, but we had, we did an advisory panel process where we didn't try and tell them what to think. We just said, um, you know, gave them the, the prompt. The prompt was, um, What's been your experience developing on PlayStation 3 to date, and what do you think would make you more successful doing that going forward? And we did a really free ruling kind of advisory panel session, and we had invited some people from Japan, and they came there and they sat quietly. 
they were astonished at what they heard. We had all these, all these great quotes from the developers. At the end of the day, we asked them, you know, what's the top 10 things we'd fix? And they would all they collaboratively kind of, you know, sort everything out. So, okay, yeah, that, if you fix that, that's our top 10 wish list. Yeah. Took it all to Japan, and there's a whole story there about, you know, Kazurai retiring and, sorry, Kazurai taking over as Ken Kudaragi was retiring and all that kind of stuff. There was a whole story there, but kind of turned it around. Like, we brought developer feedback into the PlayStation SDK and tooling process. Um, and after that, they were like, your developers will actually talk to you and in front of each other, which it turns out Japanese developers don't do. Yeah, yeah. Um, Japanese developers, there's a uh, there's a cultural stigma against saying, you know, I can't I can't make this work, or you haven't given me the tools, and not, you know, it's it's a poor craftsman who blames his tools kind of thing. Well, fair, well, um, that's one, Brett. You know, <laughs> he stood up. Yeah. Um, and also, when they had a developer conference in Japan, like their developers would only sit together at the tables, and they would never talk to each other. Nobody would ask a question. Right. Whereas in the U.S., it's like they would happily, you know, yeah. swap swap stories. People move between companies, and in Japan, people don't, don't move between companies. So they were astonished at the level of feedback we're getting from developers in the U.S. And so we started running this advisory panel on a regular process, like let's do one focused on sound, let's do one focused on QA, let's mm-hmm. do one focused on you know all these different things. And so we started this advisory panel process, which I think is is my my biggest lasting impact at PlayStation is probably that. And by the time PS4 rolled around, we were super tight with developers. We were doing exactly the right things with them. Um, much better relationships. Uh, but yeah, I, I like Sony. Um, Sony had its own problems. Um, you know, it's a, Sony is a giant name, but PlayStation was a tiny company. Um, it, uh, it meant that everybody worked really, really hard, did more than one job. Um, but it also meant that if you wanted to make a change, there were only like two or three people you had to convince. Mm. Um, and it was a culture where it was better to, to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, which I did quite a lot when I set up the developer website, things like that. I just, nobody told me to do it. I just did it. Good, good. And then, you know, uh, we had different, different developer service groups in Europe and the U S and like one was in London, one was in Foster City. We're all speaking English and all our materials are English. Why are we doing that? <laughs> so like getting together with somebody from there and figuring out how to collaborate across the ocean and, you know, get DevNet going. DevNet I was very proud of. DevNet was, I think to this date, still has features that are not easily available in the SaaS market, if you're looking to set up a platform like that, I've, I've had people leave and then come to me and say, how can I do that now? What product does that? I'm like, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, but we did a bunch of stuff there to like, you know, you want Kojima, Kojima's crew at Konami needs to be able to be able to talk about Metal Gear with us without the people in Konami Tokyo who are working on Dance Dance Revolution. They're not allowed to see each other's questions. Wow. And so like all these custom, like weird things for like handling support and, and weird partitioning between different parts of companies for keeping secrets and, Japanese rules like that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was um, it was quite a time, and I got to see you know I arrived there right before PS uh, two mm. shipped, um, and I I was there for pretty much everything that happened there. Um, you know PSP, PS Vita, um, you know iToy, i Move, um, PSVR. Uh, you know I, I kind of went through all those launches, and uh, at a certain point those started to feel a little bit repetitive. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like okay, there will be another amazing leap in tech, and we are going to you know bust our asses to get it off the ground and shipped on time. And there will be some rough games at launch and so on, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I got kind of tired of it, but um, it was a good career. Um, nobody really stopped me. Again, mm. it's it's astonishing what you can do when nobody stops you. Mm. And I had a my boss there, Jay Patton, was very forgiving of me. He was he was happy to have me try things out and and see what worked. Um, I had to kind of figure out management on the fly, which was really rough for me. It's very difficult for engineers to learn how to manage other people. It took me probably, probably wasn't until the last five years I was there that I was a competent manager. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and not, and it, not just a frustrated engineer. Um, I, I, I was given room when we were having, we were into real problems as we were scaling up operations on DevNet and the code base was getting cra- crappy. Um, I was given a lot of room to kind of reset. And so along with our, our companion team in London, we actually, you know, went through the agile transformation, learning scrum and, you know, retraining everybody and starting to change the way we worked and be more collaborative and pairing and iterative and agile, all the, all the different things that you develop now. So I was able to do that kind of, rel- you know, I had a lot of room at PlayStation to do that. I really appreciate that. Stuff, yeah. uh, but there was a lot of difficulty that PlayStation was, um, where Microsoft was a global company, PlayStation was an international company. Oh, yeah. What I mean by yeah. that is that, like, 
Microsoft had like a central office and like central people and like these sort of, it was like a hub and there were spokes in the different territories. PlayStation was like these different sort of fiefdoms loosely under one kingdom and they would sort of like who's dominant and like, okay, you had the same people doing the date, same job in three different territories. And so like, you know, developers would try and ship a game and it was like shipping to three different companies to go to different territories. And there's a lot of sort of um, difficulty getting things in a PlayStation because you had to kind of pull the other regions with you or to pull and tuck on them. Um, but there's also kind of fit with the Japanese notion of consensus and that like no one person's in charge and like yeah. everybody kind of shares responsibility. Um, so there are all kinds of weird cultural things there. I went to Japan quite a lot. Um, and just sort of took me years to kind of get down some of the like, okay, how do you talk to Japanese people in a way that they'll not rebel? Mm. Um, things like, you know, don't force somebody to make a decision in a meeting in front of you. Mm. Right. Or, um, don't, you know, if you ask a provocative or difficult question, don't be the first person to break the silence afterwards. Like there's little things that you just learn about communicating in Japanese spaces yeah. that I had, it took me years to kind of get, get right. And once you do, you get very close ties. Mm. Um, and I miss all those people. I mean, I miss, there's a whole series of colleagues. So I always see when I went to Japan, who I don't, I don't see now. Um, but it was, uh, it was, a, it, it was a grind in and of itself in, in some ways. Um, I mean, I worked crazy hours because I had to kind of, with support, we had like things happening where we had support interaction with somebody in the U.S., which would require us to talk to Japan, and we're trying to get an answer back to them the next day. And if we don't talk to Japan that night, then they won't get an answer the next day. So we got to stay up late and meet with people of Japan and and so on. And so there was a lot of late hours, and um, as much as it was good for my career, I think I I took a big hit on my family time, right, um, right. which I I can't get back. I mean, with Lucas Arts, I wasn't married, but with PlayStation, I was married, and then I had kids, and I think I I spent a lot of time away in some really formative years there that I regret um, maybe giving them too much of myself, but, um, but it was, I had a lot of pride in what we did. Yeah. Um, you know, it, at a certain point it became sort of almost who am I? Well, I'm the guy who works at PlayStation. Um, and, uh, when I broke from that, it was very difficult to kind of figure out like, well, okay, well, who am I? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Especially when I, when I left the games as a it's like, okay, so if it's not putting my heart into this game and breaking myself on that or putting my heart into these platforms and breaking yeah. myself on that, like, what do I do? Who am I? Um, so yeah, that was actually a good break to make eventually. Oh. Sorry, I'm a bit just rambling. Uh, no, it's not much of a nerdy. Really, it's, 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 it's excellent. I mean, I really appreciate honest answers. Um, are we up? Are we up to really quickly? Really, let's do a quick few questions. I know you, you've been talking for sure. quite a long time. What are you up to these days? Then you're not in the games industry. What's your What's your role these days? Uh, so I, I work for the federal government, in the US. Yeah. Um, I. I'm working at H&F, which is sort of this agile user-centered design consultancy um, inside the government. It's sort of a startup inside the government to help other government agencies learn to do things in sort of agile, user-centered, modern, you know, DevOpsy techniques yeah. to actually own their technology decisions and, and do better instead of doing these big, giant, you know, bloated projects that don't actually succeed and waste a lot of taxpayer money. Um, and I did that partially because I. I want to make the world better for my kids. Um, and although I love making games and it's not like I was making, it's not like I was making weapons for Raytheon or something like that, you know, games don't kill people. They just, you know, they're entertainment, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're positive and great for people. But fundamentally I wanted to, you know, I wasn't sure that anything I made would be remembered like Grim Fandango or remastered. Like it would just be lost to history. At some point, every game kind of feels like an artifact of its time. And I wanted to make the, game, the world better for my kids. And I saw climate change as an issue. I saw mm. politics as an issue and, and um, justice and so on. So, Eventually, I, I looked around for things to do, and I ended up working with the government. Um, I lead a team called, uh, working on a product called Cloud.gov. And what Cloud.gov is, is it, um, it's a platform for, I, I realized once I started working, I was like, oh, I've always been a platform person. Like, Fandango was a platform, and Devnet yeah. was a platform, like, or PlayStation was a platform. Uh, it's a platform for federal agencies in the U.S. Uh, to deliver services to the public um, rapidly, securely, iteratively, mm. um, while complying with, you know, 7,000 pages of compliance language. <laughs> um, the things that make it really difficult for people to ship projects in the government and then make it really difficult to make them actually work and work the way people need them to. Mm. So it's a, it's a platform that basically kind of subsumes as much of that as possible in the platform itself so that a small team can actually ship a product and like iteratively keep improving it um, rapidly with the public. And I guess now I think about it, that's kind of what Grim was about too, is rapid iteration inside the game. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, been very fulfilling. Uh, it's a, I'm on a 
uh, a term limited appointment, which basically means that I, I work there for two years and that I have a chance to, to work there for another two years and then I have to leave. Right. So I'm in that second two year term right now. Uh, um, yeah, you know, the, the two year, two year term is so that like there's a point in time where like the government decides they want to keep you and you decide you want to keep working there. And then, sure. so I'm in the second, second there, I'll be here for another, I don't know, year and a quarter. But again, they're sort of, you know, inventing on as needed here. So it's like, okay, you know, nobody's ever done this in the government in this way. And so we have to figure out a way to you know, handle compliance or whatever. And yeah, it's, it's less flashy and it's harder to explain what I do than to say, I work on PlayStation, which everybody understands what it is. Yeah, of course. Or I made this game and it's a box I can hold up. Like, but um, the intangibles here is that, you know, saving billions of dollars that can go into actual uh, programs that help people where uh, it was uh, going to waste. You know, yeah. kind of a big deal. Not Brett, brilliant. That's, that sounds really interesting stuff. Really on what you mean that. Um, are you a gamer outside? You know, I know you're not in the games right now, but do you, do you have any personal favorite games? Have you got a top three games of all time as, as a fan? Um, I am a gamer. I don't play nearly as much as other people do, um, especially since I had kids, although my kids are now getting old enough that I can play with them quite yeah. a bit more. Um, uh, I would say that from the time I, I went to PlayStation when I stopped playing really regularly, and I got to the point where I'd play like three or four or five really big games each year, and beyond that, I just didn't have time um, to really delve into them much. Um, let's see favorite games of all time um, I still remember intimately the experience of playing the original XCOM mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah. Um, that game was huge for me it was just such a brilliant game and 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 also I remember the huge biting disappointment of XCOM too like they changed the textures and it's the same game <laughs> um, that was a brilliant game uh, I love the I love the modern remaster and re, or sorry reboot of XCOM. Yeah. It's been done recently in the last few years. Brilliant, brilliant game. Um, I think my favorite recently has been Horizon Zero Dawn, right, which yeah. I think is just I did I when I first saw the trailer day three I'm like, yeah, I can't imagine myself playing that game. And then it's I I could not get enough of that game. It's so 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 good. Even the the smallest side mission feels. Know, handcrafted and beautiful and, and interesting. Mm. Um, I I one of the, one of the few games I've gotten the platinum trophy on because I just got everything in it and you know well couldn't stop playing. And Frozen Wilds I, I consumed in like a few days. Um, I usually end up playing like you know because I, I play so few games I kind of end up p- picking like the really what's the what's the biggest coolest thing I could do you know with, with my precious game time this year. Um, I love the Uncharted games. I played yeah. Uncharted Four. I thought was Absolutely brilliant, um, uh, as well as the recent one. Um, those were all quite good. Uh, other favorite games? Well, that's a pretty good know. list. That is a maybe, pretty good list. Maybe, I mean, just for something different than all those, the original SSX. Oh, okay. I quite love that game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know why. Just something about that game. Oh, good answers. I have to say, very good answers. Look, Brett, we, we finish off all our interviews with a final question. It's a bit, bit bit funny, but if you could share a few drinks with a video game character, who would you choose and why? Video game character? Yeah. Would you like Trump? to... Any, any characters from Grim, Grim Fandango, for example? Uh, for example? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love, to be, I'd love to hang out with Manny. I think Manny yeah. would be a lot of fun to talk to. Um, but I, that's a character in my own game, so I can't. I can't pick Manny. Let's see yeah. character. Um, drinks the character. I think Nathan Drake. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think Nathan Drake would be a, a terrific character to have drinks with. He'd have all kinds of stories. He'd probably, you know, have, get into a bar fight by the end of the conversation. I Good answer. No, that's a great answer. Can't can't complain about that one at all. Um, yeah. Look, Brett, I really appreciate your time. It's been really, really interesting. I like your real honesty and the stories behind Grim Fandango and PlayStation were really, really fascinating. Um, I'm really, really sure our listeners are going to love this. So thank you so much for your time. Sure thing. And uh, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate, you know, I don't, I don't get to walk down memory lane all that often. So thanks for the opportunity. It's, uh, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm happy if uh, what I did in my, in my um, misguided youth has, has made a difference on anyone. I, I'd love that people still love that game. So thank you very much for... Uh, for, for making me feel that that you're, you're a legend you're a proper you know some of the games you worked on were part of my youth actually so 
Um, I'll leave you to it. I know you're a busy man. So really good luck with your future projects. Uh, maybe one day we'll see you back in the games industry, but we'll, we'll see how it goes, eh? We'll see. Yeah, I'll see what happens when this term is up in the government. <laughs> All right, Brett, you take care. I'll speak to you soon one day, hopefully. See you later. All right. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Bye-bye.